four B-25s, which were flown on every front with distinction, reconfigured to carry heavier armed loads, sometimes including a huge 75 millimeter cannon in the nose, the adaptable B-25 became the storage of Japanese shipping with a tricycle gear, twin rudders,
Volunteers who worked on the project were well qualified, having worked in the aviation industry prior to retirement. They were people of vision and loved the challenge and were parts, wings, rudders, etc., backed by truck, and several smaller crates we shipped through UPS. We had to be a bit resourceful when filling out the bill of lading. With everyone watching for terrorist activities, we dare not use such words as bomb bay doors or machine guns. Emergency cargo jettison doors, however, and excess metal ejectors seem to do the trick. <laughs> and believe it or not, customs didn't even open the crates. <laughs> we entertained visitors who came through Edmonton and wanted to see our restoration. In 2008, a B-25 from Fort Worth, Texas stopped in on its way to Alaska for a couple of summer air shows. The pilot said that the paid pilot what do you say? The pilot said that the brakes on our aircraft look better than his. So a trade was negotiated, whereby we could get his own ones, plus a few other components he had at home base. He mentioned he had a pair of main gear tires, brand new, right off the production line of 1946. They'd never been on an airplane. They were time expired, and he couldn't use them. So when you're looking at the aircraft today, those are the tires that we got from Fort Worth, Texas, and they're brand new. <laughs> Teen Squadron Mitchell that was written off May 16, 1957 in a taxi accident. And that involved brake failure at a most inopportune time and a sudden stop partway into the wall of the East Annex of this very it's a rare day that Terry Champion, who was at the controls, is not ripped or in some way reminded of this famous or infamous incident. A couple on the nose, but some aircraft did. In 1956, after the Edmonton Eskimos had won their third great cup in a row, it was felt that the cup should be prominently displayed, especially since one of the squadron pilots also played for the Eskimos. We were hoping that flying off to Roly Cook, who still lives in White Rock, B.C., would be here today. He's not running with a football, so I guess he didn't make it. We also invited the Edmonton Eskimo alumni, but they were unable to make it today. On board the craft to the Aviation Museum for future safekeeping and display. And thank you very much. dedication of this restored B-25 Mitchell. First, let me extend congratulations on the 70th anniversary of the formation of 418 City of Edmonton Squadron, RCAF. Its value history is kept within our museum walls for the public to view, and a mosquito in 418 World War II colors is a featured exhibit on our museum floor. No? Okay. Um, my pages are in large print and double space, so don't be concerned. Uh, I'd just like to tell you that uh, 418 Squadron uh, was an operational light bomber squadron uh, during the Cold War, and our task was to defend Northern Canada against attack by Russians coming over the pole. I guess they heard about us and they were scared off because they never came. Uh, there were a number of other units associated with 418 Squadron in the um, uh, enterprise here that occupied many buildings.
climate at the controls at the end of a long, frustrating day of practicing low-level bombing and gunnery. We were hampered by several, quite a number of unserviceabilities in two different aircraft that day, 312 and then 251. Now that Boeing 737 down there was built to fly for 30 years, and it flew over 61,000 hours. Wartime bombers and fighters were built for a short operational life, maybe as little as 50 to 100 flying hours. So it's a tribute actually to our maintenance people of that era that they were able to keep these old, tired airplanes flying 15 years after they were built. But every pilot left to fly the B-25 and Bill knew it was a great, great airplane. Well, that day at about 5.30 p.m., after a long, hot day, my co-pilot, Mike Chickle, and I were concentrated on parking the airplane and going home. We'd had enough. Uh, we didn't know our problems were just beginning. We didn't recognize that the hydraulic problem we briefly had in the air would inevitably lead to great failure. Didn't have my thinking cap on, I guess. And we didn't know that a hydraulic line had broken loose and that we would lose all the fluid and the brakes. So B-25 is steered on the ground uh, mainly by use of differential braking to turn left or right. Uh, there's no nose wheel steering. So just as we were approaching that corner of the ramp up there, coming past the flying club, uh, immediately down ahead of us were three airplanes parked at the corner, and of course the intention was to make a right, fairly sharp right turn and come down and park here in front of the hangar. <coughs> uh, just as we were uh, not too far away from those parked airplanes, uh, the brake pedals went to the floor. The brake pressure was zero when I looked over at the gauge. I was struck at that point because um, I immediately uh, opened the left throttle quite rapidly uh, for the left engine and of course that caused us to turn to the right and um, barely avoided those aircraft by just inches of feet. So I crossed that throttle of course, but the airplane If you could have seen 
been working, many of you have, of course, but those of you who haven't, have seen them working day after day after day on that airplane. Uh, so thank you, all the restoration guys. Uh, before I go to my final note, I don't know if anybody's mentioned that inside the hangar uh, we have some B-25 restoration t-shirts on sale. They're, they're very, very neat and they're very uh, reasonably priced at $20.